Michael Kiesling has been designing games for more than two decades, with his career launching in 1995 with two card games, Zunstuf and Family Mogulai. With Mogulai being German for cheating and I being eggs, so you have the cheating family that apparently sits in eggs. It's not the most attractive game on the market, but 1995 was a different era. I had lots of different things going on then. Kiesling has worked quite frequently with Wolfgang Kramer. They've had huge success over the years with a wide variety of titles, most famous being Mexica, Tikal, and Java. That's Life, a fantastic race game, totally along a different line to play than those three, has been wonderful as well. One of their most recent collaborations was Adventureland, which launched the uh, family game line from Haba in 2015. Kiesling is often designed on his own as well. His biggest success came in 2017 with the title lane game Azul from Plan B Games, which was then re-released by Next Move Games. He's also had Azul, Stained Glass of Sentra. Well, let's combine the last two of those items. We got some tile lane game. We got a family game from Haba with Kiesling working on his own. And now we have Miyabi. A release that will be out in late 2019 from Haba as part of its family game line. It's a tile laying game for two to four players in which you are building up gardens by laying down tiles. Let's take a look at it. Here are most of the components of Miyabi. Note that this is an advanced pre-production copy from Haba and the components and artwork are not necessarily representative of what you'll find in the produced version. Each player gets a game board. These are identical. They have a six by six grid in which you will be placing tiles over the four to six rounds of the game. The game lasts four rounds with four players, five with three, six with two players. Each round you lay out a number of tiles based on the number of players. So in a two player game, you're going to put out four single tiles. You'll put out two of the long tiles, two of the L tiles, and four of these two by two tiles. This is the pool from which players will draft. There are six tiles per player in the pool, but your ability to place them on the board will be squeezed over the course of the game. On a turn, you are going to pick one of the tiles. You're going to add it to your board. So you do something simple like this. You're going to score based on the number of objects on this tile multiplied by the level at which this tile is located. So of course, larger tiles are better in that they have more objects on them. Three points here for the fish, for the rocks, for these pagodas, and for the trees. But everything starts on the first level, so I score three points. Additionally, whatever column this object is in, you have to mark it with a lantern. And whatever this object is, it must be placed in that row in your grid. So this object can be placed anywhere in this row. And wherever I do, I must place a lantern. And now that row is off limit for any additional items this round. I can do something like on my next turn, if this tile were available, I place this with three bushes on the first level. I get three more points. And then I mark this column here because the bushes are in this row. The bushes have to, bushes are in this column. The bushes have to go in this row. Maybe next turn, if this is still available, I can take this stone and put it here because the stones have to go in the stone row. Stones go in this column. I put this here. There are two stones on the second level, so four points. I'd love to take this stone and add it on top for three points, one stone on the third level, but this column's already occupied, so I can't put anything there for now. The whole point of building up is to score the most points, and you're going to do that by taking the largest tiles and putting them on the highest levels, but of course, there are building restrictions in which every tile must fit in the grid, you can't overlap anything, you can't uh, lay something so it's half raised and half not raised. Everything has to be flat as you place it on the board. You are going to keep taking turns where you draft a tile and place it on the board, or if you cannot place something, which will not happen on the first rounds of the game, but if you cannot place something, then you pass and you are out for the round. As soon as all these tiles are done, you pass the first player marker to the next player in clockwise order. You turn over more tiles, clear off your lanterns, and start again, trying to build 
as high as possible in order to score the most points. The first time that you place an object at the fifth level, if you were the first person to do so, you get one of these bonus tiles. So you will score five to 10 additional points depending on the item that you have placed at the fifth level. Once someone has done that, then that tile is gone. So if I build up with stones up to the fifth level, I take this tile, it's now out of play, no one else can receive that bonus. So many of these bonuses will be claimed over the course of the game depending on how well you build and how well you block other people. At the end of the game, you will score majorities based on the number of items in each of your row and how many you have relative to other players. If you have the most of these red trees, you get 15 points. Whoever has second most gets seven. If there's a tie, it's a friendly tie, so two people can get 15 points and no one gets seven for second place. So you're trying to build high, but you're also trying to have these objects visible so that you can score majority points at the end of the game. Miyabi is a classic game in that it squeezes you from multiple directions. You want large tiles because they score the most points. You will have difficulty placing large tiles as the game progresses. In the first round, it feels like nothing because everyone starts with an empty board. You have no difficulty placing anything anywhere. You just wanna grab the large tiles and start building because those are worth the most points. But from the second round on, you're gonna have a little more difficulty as you start trying to build on top of other things. So then the small tiles become valuable because they'll fill gaps, which will then let you build on top. You wanna build this big consistent structure so that you can keep going higher. But of course, are those tiles going to be available at that time and will someone else take them? So you want large tiles, you need the space in which to build them, you're trying to go as high as possible, other people can draft those tiles out from under you, all the time you're trying to build up majorities to score points at the end of the game. It's very simple, very straightforward, and yet has a lot of tension worked into what's available to you. It's very classic game design in how minimalist it is, and the competition comes primarily from people competing for the same things. We want majorities. Who's going to get it? I want this bonus. Who's going to get that? I want this tile. Can you take it from me? So I've played three times on this advanced pre-production copy from Hava, once with four players, two, twice with two players. Two-player game, of course, much more straightforward, head-to-head. -head. It's easier to watch what someone is doing to see what they cannot take so you know you can leave it for a later turn, see what you want to take from them if you can possibly do so. So it's much more direct and the majorities of course are, it's either me or them, that's it. Very straightforward. So you're trying to edge people out just a little bit over and over and over. That's classic straightforward design. With four people, there's more tiles in play, there's more possibilities there. So you're competing in different avenues against other people. I'm competing against you to build highest and take this rock bonus. I'm competing against you for this majority. And your attention is scattered a bit more because there's a more competition for more things. You use all the tiles in a four player game so you know everything's coming out, but of course there's more people competing for it. In a two-player game, not all the tiles will be used, even though you play six rounds instead of four rounds. Additionally, with the two-player game, you have more opportunity to actually reach that fifth level. Because in a four-player game, you're going to fill each column four times. And if I want to build up to the fifth level, I need to do a couple of things to build a floor wait for the next round and then I build more on top of that and wait for the next round. It's much harder to build up to fifth level because of the constraints of building. Each object has to go in the proper row. Each column can be filled only once with an object. With six rounds, I have much more of an opportunity to build up and get those bonuses. So they kind of become more important just because they are more likely to be grabbed over the course of the game. Miyabi contains a few scoring variants and two expansions. Most of them are fairly straightforward. With the variants, you need only a tile to remind you and other players that this variant is in play, something to keep in mind 
while you are drafting tiles over the course of the game. With this tile, for example, you look at your largest orthogonally connected group of objects and you score one point for each of those objects. So I have these five stones that are connected. That's worth five points. Of course, the game is not over yet, and the score is only at the end of play. Maybe I'll cover them as I'm trying to build up to the fifth level, and I'll build some other group of objects over time. With this variant, you look at your largest orthogonally connected meadow, and you score two points for each of those spaces. So I have four right now. Again, this could change. With this variant, you look at each row and column at the end of the game, and if you have exactly seven objects in a row or column, you get seven points. All three of these are primarily going to affect what tile you might place in the game. It just squeezes your choices without introducing something new beyond what you care about. As designers have said, multiple times, your scoring system is your game. This is what is going to drive play, what people care about. And you can add these in from the first game if you want, but it might be a little overwhelming because initially you wanna work out what's the value of a tile at a certain level as you try to build, as you're trying to get the bonus points, and as you're trying to get majorities at the end of the game. Adding on these additional elements might be one step too much. You have a couple of expansions. You have the frog expansion. At the start of play, each player puts a silver frog on some space on the board. Before or after they place the tile on their turn, they can move the frog one space orthogonally. So it can go onto the same level or it can go up, but it can never go back down. When it jumps up onto the first level, you score one point. And when you jump on the second level, it scores two points. However, the frog cannot go onto objects. So if I want to move here, I need to put something down and then put something else down on another turn, and then I can jump the frog up onto the second level. So more constraints to play, I'll get two points. So it seems like a lot of work for at most 15 points. Winning, when winning scores have been, in my three games, around 150 to 200 points. So. Not that much going on there. The final one is the Zen tile expansion. You have 16 Zen tiles. You turn over five at random. On a turn, instead of taking a tile from the pool, you can take one of these Zen tiles and they have to be placed on an empty space. So if there was a stone, I can always draft a stone and put it here. If later on I was able to surround this tile, then you score one point for each object surrounding it in addition to itself. So when I place this tile, I would mark it. Can't place anything else in that column. I earn one point because it's one object being placed on the first level. When later I surround it, I will score one, two, three, four, five, six, seven points. And now, since I have surrounded this tile, I can now draft another one. You can be working on only one of these at a time but it increases the value of a particular space. The drawback, you can never cover that space. Once it's there, it's there. You wanna keep those patterns in the sand and you cannot mess with them. And initially this seems like a real constriction. I played one game with the Zen tiles and it seemed iffy whether you would actually want to do it or not, but you often end up with empty spaces on your board. So it's not a drawback. You're not going to fill everything anyway because for the most part, you're trying to build high. So you're not just trying to build across everything. This gives you a different reason. Ideally, you fit these in the board and then you're gonna score a bunch of points instead of only one point. This tile, still just one point, worthless. This one gets me seven for that one. So it can be worth it as you're building up over time. The difficulty, of course, comes when I place this on a later turn and now I cannot place this one at all because I have no empty spaces and these all must go on the first level. The expansions and variants are included in the box should you want more variety in gameplay, but you don't necessarily need them because the Koro Miyabi is so solid. It's a classic old school German game design. I don't say that just because Kiesling is German, but because the style of Miyabi embodies a sort of old school philosophy where people are competing for the same things. We're not just trying to build our own world, although we are. We're drafting tiles and putting them in our own garden. I can't necessarily affect your garden, except for taking tiles that you want. 
but we're racing for bonuses. We're competing for majorities. We're trying to keep each other from scoring. So even though I can't take the area away from you, I can take tiles away from you that keep you from adding to that area. So we still have this shared communal game space where we have lots of competition for tiles and the bonuses and the majorities in the basic gameplay. There's no expansion needed for that. The variants add more complication, more elements to consider. I don't know if that's necessary because the core is so solid. The core gives you a lot to work with already in terms of the competition among other players if you are paying attention to that. You can just put blinders on, I build my own world, I don't, I don't consider what other people are doing, I don't look to see whether you're going to take tiles that I want, or can take tiles that I want, or cannot take tiles, maybe I just do my own thing, and I can do that. That's how lots of classic family games work. If you look at something like Ticket to Ride, you can just play focusing solely on your own board and not worry about other people. You look at Azul, you can do that, just look at your own board, but you're gonna get hurt by the people who are paying attention more to the entire game, who have some sort of ability to survey everything and have an idea of who's going to do what when, what people are fighting for, what people want, and I'm trying to edge out majorities, I'm trying to get the bonuses first, so I have to be aware of the competition in order to maximize my abilities to do that. You can play more thoughtfully just with the base game without adding on the complications of, oh, here's another way to score, and I'm gonna score for Meadows, and I'm gonna score for seven points. I played three times, as I mentioned. One time we played with the Zen tiles and the seven bonus, and the seven bonus didn't change much because, of course, over the early rounds of the game, you're just trying to build high. You're gonna score more points for putting something down at a third or fourth level with lots of objects on it than you are for these seven points at the end of the game. And even at the end of the game, we often were saying, well, I can put this tile here, it's gonna disrupt my seven, but I get nine points off of it. So that's better, yes? Looking at the other tiles that are available, this is still my best option. So it's a little bit of, you know, Oh, one or the other, it didn't matter that much. We each scored the seven bonus three times, so it was a wash on there. Again, one time playing that. Maybe with more play, it would matter more. Although, it seemed more of a distraction than the actual focus on the majorities and the bonuses. The Zen tiles was more interesting because it brought this other element of gameplay where you had to keep things low. I needed empty spaces if I wanted to take a Zen tile. Put that in there and then build around it. And ideally stick things with three objects next to it in order to maximize the scoring for that. And that was a more interesting, complicating element to the gameplay because you cannot build on those tiles either. So it provided something different other than the scoring variants of Largest connected group, largest connected meadow, rows and columns. It's interesting. And again, I don't know if it's necessary. Just the gameplay itself is solid. So I played only three times. That's my early first impressions of you going into this delightfully charming, calming looking world in which you are trying to, of course, cut people other off, off from scoring. Yes, it looks so charming and nice, but ideally you'll leave a few bodies in the garden. <laughs>